we've got many, many different ends, you know, uh, uh, health, education, security, uh, various things, and many different means. We've got all kinds of, you know, timber, coal, um, various resources, uh, means that we, that we allocate. The idea of the ends mean spectrum is not at all to deny that important intermediate allocation problem, to take that as, as central, but to extend uh, beyond where e economics has imposed limits on itself. That is to say, let's don't just stop at intermediate ends. We have to choose among intermediate ends. How do we choose among good things? Which one is better? Or some, some common denominator of good things within which we can compare them and at least rank them partially. So that uh, then I referred to as the ultimate end as opposed to intermediate ends. It's a criterion by which, by which you rank intermediate ends. You rank them according to which one contributes most to, comes closest to the ultimate end. Now that, of course, is a huge problem. I mean, if we knew the ultimate end, we'd, we'd all be extremely, extremely wise. But the fact that you can't define something clearly doesn't mean that, you, that you're not logically required to think in terms of it, because we, we can't escape the problem of ranking intermediate ends. That's the ethical problem of, of ranking intermediate ends in terms of some coherence with their relation to an ultimate end. So there's, there's an implication that Aristotle uh, emphasized, among others, that however vaguely we, we might perceive it, you know, it, we have to think of it as real and reason in terms of it. And I think that imposes on us a, uh, two things. One, a great deal of tolerance in terms of our differing understandings of what actually is the ultimate end. So we have to reason together and respect each other's views. But at the same time, there's a kind of a dogmatic necessity for believing that there is such a thing as an ultimate end, even though we may not be able to perceive it very clearly. Because if we didn't believe that, then there wouldn't be much point in our reasoning together in order to, if we deny that such a thing existed, then what's our criterion for ranking intermediate ends? It's just your opinion versus mine. We don't have anything on the basis of which we can appeal to convince one another in a reasoned dialogue. And so we have to have that. And that's, you know, philosophy, religion, ethics gets us up into that uh, realm. So that, that's, and then the other direction going from intermediate means, petroleum, iron, coal, timber. Um, it's the same kind of question, only with a better possibility of coming to a, an agreed upon answer, I think. What is the common denominator of all useful things? What is it that, that every, all resources share uh, that makes them capable of satisfying our wants or serving our needs in, in some way? Well, rather surprisingly, I think there's a good answer to that, and that is low entropy. Uh, things which we are able to use have a physical characteristic in common, uh, which is low entropy. And we can think of resources as, um, as being alternative sources of this, of this uh, basic flow from low to high entropy, off of which all physical processes operate, including our lives. Uh, so this is, this is ultimately what, we're, what we live on. So it's important for economists to think about it, to know about the physics of entropy and um, I should say just parenthetically right quick, there's an immediate temptation here to have to leap to an entropy theory of value and say, well, the value of everything is proportional to the uh, lowness of entropy. Well, no, that, 
economists say, wait a minute, there's the other end of the spec. There's the whole demand side, the whole desirability side. Maybe some forms of low entropy are just not as desirable as others. After all, edible mushrooms have low entropy. The valuable poisonous mushrooms do not have low entropy. Or, excuse me, they have just as much low entropy. But they're not desirable, so there's not a one-to-one -one relation. Students, I use this example, and students say, yeah, but suppose you want to poison someone. Well, okay, if you want to poison someone, then I guess I'm, I'm uh, a bit of a problem on that example, at least. Um, but, so that, fact number one then, low entropy ultimate means. So we have to go beyond that a little bit, though, and analyze the nature of our ultimate means. And this we're very indebted to Georgescu Rogan for uh, really, I think, pointing, pointing the way here. And basically he said, well, we've got two sources of low entropy. We have the solar source, radiant energy from the sun. We have the terrestrial source, stocks of fossil fuels and minerals in the Earth's crust. And being a good economist, he said, what is the pattern of scarcity of these two sources of our ultimate means? The sun, solar energy, in its stock dimension is practically unlimited. It's huge. But its flow dimension of arrival to the earth is strictly limited. So we can't make it flow any faster than it does. And we can't go up and mine the sun and take away tomorrow's solar energy and use it today. So the limiting factor then is, in that case, is the flow rate of arrival to the earth. It arrives at its own rate and it's dispersed, distributed, and not very, although it may feel intense to those light-skinned people among us, not very intense in terms of its energy. Well, then you turn to the terrestrial stock of low entropy. This, compared to the amount of low entropy in the sun, this is very small, but we can use it at a rate of our own choosing. We can use it up fast. We can mine tomorrow's coal today, and it's very tempting and convenient to do so. We do it, and, uh, and so terrestrial low entropy is extremely uh, useful and, and has fueled our growth for quite a long time. So highly convenient, flow variable, flow abundant, at least flow there, but stock limited. So a very different pattern of scarcity. And uh, part of our difficulty that ecological economics has to deal with is that we've become so dependent upon the terrestrial source that, um, well, we're beginning to experience problems of running out both of the, of the source and, and the sink uh, areas. Um, so we really need to think very clearly about the, the sources of low, of low entropy and how to economically adapt our lives to the conditions of scarcity that they impose, the different conditions of scarcity they impose. Um, so I think that's kind of the, the, the way uh, that looking at the ends mean spectrum is helpful to ecological economists, and it, it frames the whole problem in a very large sense. It says what, you know, the ultimate economic problem is to allocate the ultimate means, low entry, in the service of the ultimate end. Uh, that's such a large question that it's overwhelming, and you can't, I, I can't at least get my mind around it as a single question. So it's absolutely necessary to break it up and you think in terms of, well, let's go step by step here from low entropy ultimate means to techni technical uses of converting that, technical means of converting that into intermediate means, then economic problems of allocating the intermediate means among some hierarchy of intermediate ends, then the ethical problem of how did we get that hierarchy of intermediate ends? How do we know one thing goes above another uh, and break it down? And, but each piece of the problem only really makes sense 
is see, seen as a as a part of a total picture, even though the total picture, uh, just without the differentiation, is is kind of overwhelming. So we do need specialization and breaking down, but specialties without some overall picture are not very satisfying.